was just a really happy-go-lucky person. Just heaps of energy and vibrant and loving life. But then Louise was hit with some devastating news. Her friend was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and had renal failure. He was told that if he didn't have a kidney transplant, he'd die. And he didn't ask me for a kidney. I just offered because it just seemed natural because I loved him and wanted him to be happy again. Her selfless act saved her friend's life. But ten months after the operation, Louise was readmitted to hospital. She had an obstruction on her bowel and was in severe pain. And the surgeon said, you must get her ready for theatre now. She's got an obstruction and I need to get there now. So the surgeon came from his home and operated on me straight away and said if I'd have been an hour later, I would have been dead. Just the whole world fell apart. I just felt like I'd failed. I'd failed my friend because I just felt hopeless. During this already emotional time, Louise's younger brother Daniel died suddenly in bed after a seizure. This also triggered an irrational fear of death and being alone. So much so that she moved back to Newcastle to have the security of staying with her family. Not long after I arrived back, I started to get really bad panic attacks and just feeling like I was dying. And that They've just got worse and worse and worse, and the memory of each one just compounds how terrified I feel. And I don't want to die. You know, I do everything right. I want to look after myself. I don't understand why I feel like this. Nick and Eva Speakman start the therapy and focus on making Louise realise she's stronger and healthier than she thinks. So basically, he's struggling with life and has renal failure and you step in and, and save his life. <laughs> Sounds nice right? when someone else says that, yeah. Mm -hmm. You've got a fear of how do I live my life moving forward with one kidney? Mm -hmm. How good was your kidney? The nephrologist said it's the best one he's ever seen. OK. It was very big as well. He said I was born to donate a kidney because it was nearly the size of a male organ. What does that tell you about the kidney that you've got? That it's a really good one. OK. And I shouldn't be worried. And to reiterate that point, the Speakmans take Louise to see a doctor. So taking one kidney out and giving it to somebody else, you've still got sort of quite a spare capacity in your remaining kidney. There's, there's data to show that donors actually live longer than normal people. I was told that before the, the transplant, actually, and I should have remembered that. It's something that's kind you of know, just you, went, poof, you know, they said that. So you're top 3% of the population in terms of fitness. You've got spare capacity, so you should have no problems whatsoever. The only thing I would do is get your blood pressure checked, perhaps every six months or so, and get a kidney function test once a year. And Louise joins us alongside the Speakmans. Welcome to you, Louise. Hi. Lovely to have you. Now, the part of the process, of originally, first of all, with you guys, is to identify the issues. And then once you know what the issues are, what's causing the problem, you go through them one by one. And in Louise's case, there was quite a list, really, mm. wasn't there? Yeah. There was a very, very much a list. Uh, initially, it was PTSD, but it spiralled into monophobia, which is fear of being alone, uh, talentophobia, which is the fear of death, um, sybophobia fear of food, and also OCDs. So right. what it was uh, a very complex case, and it's a really great example how one thing, such as PTSD, can spiral into other areas and become very complex. Yeah. And how did you begin to deal with that complex list of things? Because we saw there uh, that, that the minute you started to speak, you were incredibly emotional. So how do you cut through that and get to the, to the nub of what it is? Well, ultimately, we found, where did it start? Because Louise, <coughs> Louise had seen six therapists and they'd all sort of concentrated on the fear of food, which was one of the, you know, the, bi the symptoms, basically. So, ultimately, what we uncovered, uh, Louise was in, <coughs> got PTSD from the moment that she was told, if you'd not had an operation within the next hour, you would die. So that was the start of it. Mm. And then, so she, she had this fear of being alone because she thought, I was on my own and I could die. And then it, it was compounded by the fact that... A, her brother sadly died in his sleep. Mm. So those two things together meant that she was just frightened of being alone. So, Louise, for you, it was just a case of getting all those bits and pieces and seeing them rationally. Yeah. Yep. As simple as Absolutely. that. Absolutely, yeah. 
And so what did they say? What were the things that they said that made you do a U-turn on all of these thoughts that you'd had in your head up until now? Just got me to go back to the moment when I felt like that and realise that I was OK. I didn't, I didn't die. Mm -hmm. I wasn't dying. It was just um, an irrational perspective and they got me to see it for how it really was. And um, to be feeling like that moving on made no sense. You know, it was right. just something that was stuck there. And Eva sort of described it being a bit like a record mm -hmm. that's just kind of going round and round and round in the same spot and they just kind of nudged me on and... Well, it's changed you know, your life. Absolutely. You've been out, you, no fear of being on your own now. You're outside, you can stand in the, in the middle of a field, yep. <laughs> uh, which you would never... That, that's unthinkable. <laughs> and, and something as simple as that for many people, mm -hmm. unthinkable for you. Um, you're sleeping on your own. Your mm -hmm. dad was your carer, having to sleep in the room with you. He's no longer there. You're on your own. Um, in <laughs> fact, we've got a... We've got... Because this has had a profound effect on your family and friends as well. Yep. Here's your dad. Just um, really come right back to what she was. Lovely, bubbly person, you know? And it's just lovely. I'm so proud of her. I'm so proud of her. And before any of this happened, you had a career, you were your personal trainer, all of that was put on hold, haven't been able to do it, and since this, you've got a job, have yeah. you? Yeah, <laughs> start tomorrow. <laughs> That's fantastic. And uh, we asked her the, the two tests that we could do, what could you never do when we first met her? And she actually said, I could never stand in a field on a lo alone. And the second thing that Louise said was that I could, we said about coming to London, she just said, there is no way I could stay in a hotel room or come to London on my own. Louise is the first person that we've ever worked with that has actually come to London by herself. There is nobody here, not one member wow. of her family is here. <laughs> and she well came done. yesterday. She's been amazing. Well done, Thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. Well done. Thank you.